Okay, folks. Part D, which uh, is not really directly health and medicine, it describes what what's happening to the world because of the sad coronavirus, which is giving us so much trouble. So, this is the impact of the coronavirus, and we're going to do it across many different areas. Okay. All right. Just recently, there was a large stimulus bill, a mere two trillion dollars. And it has some direct impact on digital health. So this is one of the few slides which is directly digital health. And it points out there's going to be hospital funding, because a lot of the hospitals obviously have a lot of additional expenses. Um, the, there will interestingly be substantial funds to do telehealth. You remember this uh, organization, I got this from the Business Insider Intelligence. Didn't think telehealth would take over, but now it, there is some better chance, and this funds could help. And more broadly, the fact that there is some obvious advantage to telehealth, which have been highlighted by the uh, social distancing and and serious risk to healthcare providers from the virus. All right, <clears throat> here is a little more on telehealth. Um, points out that rural hospitals, which are the ones that telehealth is trying to help, uh, have actually not done very well recently. And there's going to be money to help that. And of course, there's the virtual care providers, which is the telehealth directly. And uh, here is some comment about, actually, as a function of almost all ages. Um, the majority of people say they're willing to try telehealth. And among the younger generation is dominant, 74% are very or somewhat willing. So that's likely to, well, here it gives an example, 312% increase in New York, which is obviously at the moment the most seriously impacted increase in telehealth services. And um, of course, this, as always, uh, this um, increase in demand has led to a decrease in service from six minutes to 33 minutes wait time. Still, that's uh, still quicker than going to the nearest hospital. Um, now we have a slightly different impact on digital health, which what will the recession do? Because obviously the, there is or will be a recession. Um, and there will, for relatively obvious reasons, be some difficulties for initiatives which are not um, directly relevant to patients at this time. And in general, uh, we, it's probably not li necessarily likely to be um, a decrease in money going into healthcare. However, that money will go digital health. That money will go into um, uh, startups that are more clearly identified or align with the problems that the coronavirus has highlighted. Um, so that's what she says. Now be more cautious. And again, telehealth, virtual consultations will be magnets. Um, more generally, there's a, here is a survey as to whether there will be a recession. And most people think there will be a recession, and some people think there is a recession already. And uh, people seem quite optimistic, but maybe that's life. People are optimistic. They do not think it will be, the majority think it will be moderate. Probably nobody really knows what moderate means. Um, so the smaller firms will have difficulties getting money in these times. There are the, the availability of funding to do innovative things will obviously go down because you're going to put that money to absolute essentials. Um, and the newer startups in telehealth or other digital health areas will have some trouble. Um, and this points out obviously this increase in use gives you crashes. Um, 
Zoom has had a sort of interesting problem. It's gotten violently attacked about security, although its scaling has been incredible. I've been on giant Zooms, which appear to work perfectly. Um, so you obviously diagnostic coronavirus testing, testing going to be a hot product. And people who sell, I don't know, we had a comment about beauty. People that sell non-essential products, um, which are some of those software add-ons of digital therapeutics, they may take a blow because those will not be people frustrated and losing money due to the, due to the lockdowns are not going to go into um, discretionary spending. So, and especially when those people are selling directly to consumers, because the lack of money is directly true for consumers. Hospitals presumably have a better chance of keeping, keeping their money. All right, here is a sort of general list I found of some impacts on particular companies. So, here is obviously a vacation or trip-related company. It's um, making major cutbacks. Um, so it's something called Wonder School uh, has, has laid off 75% of its staff. Airbnb is obviously significantly impact, and one of their uh, associates is laying off 30% of its staff. Real estate is certainly not a very hot. Business at the moment, it's uh, having cutbacks. Um, the uh, a company called Combine um, also cut, cut off more than half its employees. Uh, Notel, which does flexible space, just laid off 30% of its workers and furloughed another 20%. Um, AMC Entertainment, they in Bloomington run the local cinemas. And um, it said it's essentially cutting back and, they, and following people so they can afford to reopen. Hobby Lobby, also in College Mall, is laying off people. Tesla uh, is furloughing workers in some areas. Uh, scooters, we have bird scooters in Bloomington. Though that is hardly a hot area now. People aren't scooting around quite as much as they used to. And many other companies, including oil giants, are having little problems. The oil is, is just not, people aren't traveling as much. All right, so here is a more general discussion of the virus and digital health, which repeats some of the uh, um, <coughs> Some of the previous uh, remarks. This is about telehealth. Um, it mentions a company called Plush Care, which uh, has a 40% increase in appointment volume. And um, this particular company has a 10% increase during any flu season. Um, and so, anyway, this particular business insider expects telehealth to, to, to actually be. Successful. Remote monitoring. And uh, I've always, it's clear that that ought to be more remote monitoring. The current assembly of devices is very ad hoc. Some are on Apple Watches, some are not. Uh, Fitbit hides the information they get from you. It's really very unsatisfactory. So I think a much more thorough uh, approach to Remote monitor, health monitoring, where they actually make the data available, not only to doctors but also patients, um, is important. And we know remote monitoring is an important part of any telehealth. I once had this famous photo of myself in 1994 with Hillary Clinton, who lost the last election. At that time, she um, is trying to have a major health initiative in the US government, including telehealth. And I was showing her a demonstration back in 1994 of telehealth. So telehealth has been a, an area being researched for many, many years, but it has never taken off. We were doing it in things like prisons and other sort of special circumstances. But we effectively, after Hillary's effort collapsed, 
we stopped working in that area. There were others more diligent than me or more committed kept on. Um, here we have an alert system getting the latest updates. This is part of the information retrieval. Remember, we there was a company that actually has claims to have uh, identified the virus before the CDC because they got it on December 31st, and the WHO and CDC were a week or so later. Um, so there are companies which are providing this information and trying to extract from the in. in you know, there's such a huge amount of real and fake information out there. They're trying to extract real information and get it to the people who need it. It's a pretty reasonable business. Banking. So here we're now looking at the virus on other of the areas we've studied. And banking was one of them. And uh, lending is not going to be as good a business as it used to be, partly because the interest rates have dropped. And uh, also, there are going to be people who just can't pay their loans. And so the amount of paid interest will go down. Um, and you know, here we have increased credit lines and deferred payments. And that these big banks are under huge pressure to be nice to people. And of course, people aren't going to put so much money in the banks because they don't have as much money. They're going to take the money out to spend. And then there's lots of social pressure for banks to be kind, waive fees, not crack down on people who are late on mortgage payments and things like that. Uh, and not pay overdraft fees and things like that. And notice there's $11 billion US consumers paid in bounce check and overdraft fees in 2017. That's a lot of money in one year just for which the banks would will be under a lot of pressure to not charge. Um, workforce. Well, of course, I don't think many people will be going to banks. I know certainly it's an essential business. Um, so there's going to be an increase in the digital banking. We actually discussed that in banking. So this will actually enhance digital banking. Um, it seems Chase closed 20% of its nationwide branches. BBVA, which is I think a South American bank, are um, cutting back. Um, and then there is a need for childcare for early employees because there's no school and things like that. Um, reputation, actually this is true for all these giant companies. You do not want to come out of this virus with a bad reputation of being cruel to people. And um, so this is important. FinTech. Well, here's another survey about um, recession. And uh, here we have extremely and very likely 78%. So that says there'll be a recession. And they're here, in this one here, 38% says it will be severe. So that's quite a lot. Um, and in the FinTech area, um, there will obviously just be a reduction of funding. Because I don't think FinTech is one of these ones which in some sense will Unlike, say, medical device manufacturers, which will benefit from the virus, because their products will be enhanced, have enhanced value during the, because of the virus. I don't think that's true of FinTech. Um, so, and we know that, we remember how with FinTechs work, they actually, they're all losing money to try to, well, a lot of them are. Some, if they're just doing, say, banking as a service, are probably making money if they, at least they could. The ones that are trying to get lots of deposits because they're neobanks, uh, those will have trouble because they were losing money. And in this type of environment, losing money is less satisfactory than in a very optimistic bull market where everybody is doing well. So. There will be less money to start fintechs and less money to rescue fintechs. And of course, that's what I was saying. It says 
companies will go bust. The smaller, less over leveraged ones, which were maybe too optimistic, will not make it. Investors will be risk averse, and there's just not many. There's just not the, not the time to go out and say, hi, fellows, let's be, I, I can give you better stock advice. Nobody wants stock advice. Um, they just regret buying stocks in the first place if they've all gone down 25%. Um, if, the, if the FinTech has made it through that initial stage and actually is flourishing, building banking as a service, then uh, that will have a flip side, because banking as a service, which is, is ought to go up, because P, this particular shutdown has actually enhanced the, uh, uh, ad, the digital versions of all, in, all industries. Everyone, not just health, but banking and everything. Um, and a note that we note here that the FinTech actually got, you know, the FinTechs started booming in 2012 to 2014 through 2017 and 18. And they never have seen a financial crisis before. So the whole business model and mentality is geared to the bull. Is this a bull? I doubt it, no. It's a fox. Um, so, you know, things will, some things will be interesting. Uh, whether robo-advisors will actually have been trained to give the right answers for this particular example is not so obvious. I'm not certain humans were, but some humans will. So, um, it's a really tricky time. I wouldn't want to be a FinTech at this time. Unless I was building solid back-end banking as a service technology. Um, and it says here, of course, they should really focus on sustainability, not growth, um, and exploiting current customers. So that's, uh, that's there will be some changes here. Uh, and it will just accelerate the shakeout between the win, winners and the losers. Um, there are various new business models like income promise, uh, which is basically I mean, some sort of product to insure people against loss of income. And um, it, whether or not this will be uh, a good idea is not quite so obvious to me. I don't quite see how you make money on this, because there are going to be too many people who have to be paid, and not enough people are willing to, because I mean, the, it's relatively obvious who will be laid off, so I'm not certain why that's a good idea. Um, here's an interesting comment on the gig economy workers on um, whether, what, what their feature is, and um, this one here, I either agree, strongly agree, or neither agree or disagree. So only 28% um, disagree with the statement that the gig economy, which is where we are now, I guess, they prefer flexibility and independence over job security and benefits. But of course, that will change as they need benefits. So this, they, these gig, gig economy, as in the previous discussion, they have not seen a recession before. Um, E-commerce will grow, but there will be a recession because non-e-commerce will go down more than e-commerce will grow. Because uh, the consumer will, in net, spend less because they have less money. So that's sort of inevitable. And we know that brick and mortar spending will plummet because brick and mortar building, I mean, stores are closed, a lots of them, go to College Mall. Full of closed stores. Um, so I don't. This is one of these typical surveys which asks the obvious. I think it's fair to say that the although there's an important impact on um, commerce, it was not quite as great as people anticipated back in March and April when things were plunging down. That's because um, although some of these Specialized companies like Macy's did not do so well. 
because people did really did cut down on luxury things. That really wasn't true about Amazon, Walmart, and Sam's. I mean, these companies which were well set up to do necessities, because people still purchase necessities. And um, here we have the uh, monthly adjusted sales through June, with some minor changes. We have it now through July. And up here we have the annual changes showing the around a 12% swing from instead of being plus 6% to being minus 6%. And you can see it's actually recovered sort of in June and July. It's not so far off from what it ought to be. And um, I mean, just worth noticing, this was worse than what happened in the last recession, 2008 to 2009. And here we have a set of e-commerce. Uh, Charts for both U.S. and China. Here we have top top left is the U.S. showing the e-commerce percentage chugging along to 12.5 percent. Then it jumps up in Q2 2020 to 16 percent. We have here a projection from 2020, which totals 14.5 percent to 2024 18.1 percent. Um, over here we have the the corresponding China one. Notice it's much higher. In 2020, it's 40% e e-commerce. Um, here we have again a slightly different variant of this quarterly e-commerce sales showing a big Q2 2020 peak. And um, here's a comparison between China and US for something slightly confusing, show social commerce. So that's e-commerce. Organ uh, solve uh, Facebook, Instagram, and WeChat, and things like that. Again, China dominates the U.S. a factor of ten. Pretty interesting that China is so far ahead. Here we have um, the, the fact that the online grocery. For instance, my family didn't use online grocery until the COVID, and now we use it uh, quite often. Not. Dramatically, I think we still do most by brick and mortar, but we certainly do quite a lot by uh, by online grocery uh, ordering and pickup or delivery. And here is a chart through June of 2020, and we see a very clear increase, and uh, both in terms of the number of gro number of shoppers and the total volume. Um, it's sort of, I, mean, I pointed out that possibly the impact on commerce was not as much as people expected, but I say it was sort of selected. So here are companies that made it and actually saw increases in spite of the um, uh, COVID problems. Um, the uh, year ago is black, the forecast sales this year are, are pink, and yellow is the actual sales, and it's, it's in the order black. Pink, uh, yellow for Walmart, Amazon, Home Depot, Lowe's, and Target. Here we see Walmart's e-commerce component, and it's got a 97% sales group, sales growth anticipated in FY 2021 Q2. Uh, down here we have um, Target, and um, you can see that uh, that is also showing very significant uh, increases. Here we get this comment I already made, that some companies are doing very well through this crisis, others are doing not so well. And there was an expectation of many stores closing. Here's an estimate of 100,000 in five years. Meanwhile, Walmart, Costco, Target, Amazon, etc., are doing very well. But some are not doing so well. Here is uh, three, uh, three uh, one-owned stores, Dillard's, JCPenney, and Macy's. They're, each, they're plotted next to each other for um, each month, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. And you can see they were sort of hanging in there for January and February. In fact, they all went up in February. Um, but um, these are annual changes, so they went up from February 2019. But here we have these dramatic decreases, which are actually pretty similar for all these companies. Uh, maybe Dillard's a tiny bit less. 
but uh, they were worse in April and May, and now June and July they're recovering. But this is, so it says unless you had a strong e-commerce component to make up, and some of these things like, uh, well obviously Amazon had that, but so did also Walmart. Um, here you have um, some comment about uh, how the expenditures vary according to the type of company. Again, if this COVID it was pretty selective, like restaurants did very poorly for obvious reasons. But here you can see clothing stores uh, suffered more than um, building supplies and motor vehicle parts and food services. And here's an overall study that uh, only 15% said they were spending more due to in the COVID time, and 50% uh, were spending less. And so that says in general there's less spent, which is what the data shows. And here it has some pretty striking dependencies on types of products. Namely, furniture wasn't so good. Even electronic and appliance stores are not so good. You would think electronics would do okay, but not necessarily appliances. You probably wouldn't be buying a new appliance and during the peak of the COVID problems. But you would probably return to do that soon thereafter. And finally in this set we have American Express. It has a stronger travel component than most companies. And so it's probably most negatively impacted by the, of the credit card and financial, uh, consumer financial companies. And you can see how the uh, they have their billings and they've gone down quite significantly uh, in March, April, May, June, and July. Whereas they were, they were passing along with over around 10% increase in January and February. So, um, and also American Express is of course just doing all it can in terms of buy now, pay later, BNPL. And it's, there are these various reward programs, but still, it's uh, a difficulty. Okay, here is an interesting uh, little slide on advertising. For example, you would have thought Google would have done well during COVID. And it did sort of okay, but <coughs> not perfectly, because a lot of its money comes from advertising. That's actually, uh, even though it's famous for its technology, it's getting it mainly from advertising, it's dollars. And that has been drastically cut, whereas people have not drastically cut their use of Facebook and things, but they are drastically cutting uh, the advertising. Like here is US travel TV ad, well it's just not Google app, but TV ad which is related. And you can see a factor of 10 reduction in June, July a factor of five reduction. Huge effects, and uh, digital advertising is so big that it will it will be though there will be a movement from physical advertising to digital. In net, digital advertising went down, and that was ref reflected in actually both Facebook and Google and the internet companies, which get a significant dollars from uh, selling ads. Here is an interesting comment that um, advertisers are blacklisting virus-related news items. So companies like New York Times, in fact, most uh, digital web enterprises um, have a strong emphasis on virus news. Well, advertisers don't want to be associated with viruses. They want to be associated with happy events. So. This uh, so support uh, news about the virus is a double whammy. Uh, New York Times is giving it away free, for example, it's, whereas they usually have to pay for their digital, at least some of their digital material. But this, all the virus material is free, and it's not getting as much uh, ad revenue. Here, New York Times um, believes that it will only see a total of 10% decline in its ad revenue due to this issue. So these are all sort of, these are slightly more non-obvious um, consequences. Um, and the claim is that the net effect 
will be at least as much as it was in the 2008 recession, which was almost 20% reduction. Um, and here we are, we're up here in 2018 with a good solid increase. And this probably went up again in 2019. And it's going to go, hmm. Well, who knows it will go? It's not, that's too optimistic. We'll go here. And we won't tell you what the scale is. All right. Don't ask me when, when this will be over. Um, it's amusing that, well, not the podcast vendor is not amusing. But it's interesting that podcast listening has down, gone down because podcasts were listened to in cars. And people aren't using cars to, to commute to work nearly as much. So commuting has gone down, and therefore things you do while commuting, such as listening to uh, audible um, music or audible uh, recordings or podcasts, they've gone down. Um, here is a comment on the impact of on our. You might have thought the companies like Google and Facebook were actually not impacted much by the by the uh, virus because you know most of their workers can do can write uh, deep learning code from home as well as from their office, and further people are there are going to be more people accessing their pages. However, the ad, they get all their money from ads, not from the services they offer. So their services are free, and they're going to get more people using them. Wonderful. However, the advertisers will not give them as much money. So they're going to be, here's an example, poor old Delta leading, I think it's a leading US airline. It hadn't got done any ads since March 5th, after March 5th. And sports betting company, March 9th. Um, okay. The internet. Well, I was worried, I must admit, in the first few days I was home, that the internet would go down. Now, the internet has gone down, but it's actually so far come up relatively soon. In fact, even as I'm recording this, there was a storm, and the uh, Electrical supply in our house went off about six times, but rather surprisingly, it came back in a few minutes. Of course, now it will all go off for a week or something. But anyway, um, it is virus. We are more and more uh, dependent on networks, whether that be networks, be uh, the internet, that's the most obvious, or even electrical. Because uh, uh, previously, if the power was off in our house, I could go and sit in the university, but now that's forbidden. Uh, notice that uh, one reason this is maybe better than you might have thought, both Netflix and YouTube uh, lower the video resolution to reduce the network uh, use. Um, and um, also the Federal Communication Commission gave access to additional spectrum uh, to the cell phone companies. Um, so the uh, data loads of video game has gone up 75%, VPN 34%, web traffic 20%, and video 12%. Um, it's interesting that video games are the one that's gone up the most. Maybe that's just because of the fact that school was canceled. Um, but you would think that, I don't know, I would expect, say, video and to be equally popular. But uh, maybe I'm, I'm obviously not part of it. Cloud gaming, which is off to actually a rocky start, I think. It should actually, if, they, if the people doing cloud gaming get their act together, it should benefit from this. Um, and according to British Telecom BT, they think their network can do even more than it's being asked to do now. Um, and then we have uh, the uh, digital equality, or whatever it's called, namely equitable access to internet, is highlighted by these problems. Anyway, so here about connectivity. Well, obviously the connectivity has gone to the birds. 
um, initially in China, and uh, now China's recovering. It's, it's now in other parts of the world, especially, of course, New York City, France, UK, uh, Spain, Italy, Germany. And um, this is a, this actually, unfortunately, that everything is connected. And now I think Apple can make its iPhone in China, but unfortunately can't sell it in the US. Uh, at least not so easily. Maybe you can sell it over the internet. Um, anyway, this will obviously reduce the, reduce all commerce is going down, and and, the, and iPhones will just be one of them, uh, which will be impacted by by people's money, and also the ability to make it and ship it. Um, so it will, of course, it will be pretty interesting to see what happens to the relation of China and the world. After this virus, because yeah, it's a it's a slightly uh, rocky relationship, and this could or could not make it better or worse. I think it depends. China uh, China's getting blamed a lot, but uh, I think they've uh, acted reasonably responsibly, and maybe that will get recognized, or maybe they will just get blamed for just screwing the rest of the world. Okay. Lots of tech conferences, including ones I go to, were canceled. Um, and that has had huge impact, of course. It must be somewhere else. But the whole travel industry has been devastated. Hotels, airlines, I mentioned Airbnb. Um, and of course, with all these uh, tech conferences canceled, then people don't get to talk to each other and make so many innovations. Um, so there's the direct loss of a billion dollars just from cancellation of major tech events. And the online is actually a surprisingly successful replacement, but not quite the same. Um, 5G is likely to get enhanced because 5G will make uh, actually the inter interacting over the internet even better than it is now. And it will make telehealth and teleconferencing just better and better. And uh, well, that's why here we have here about uh, ZTE and China Telecom building a 5G system linking um, linking various hospitals together. So 5G has got a boost. How big an effect that is is not quite clear yet. All right. Now we have. Um, some more remarks about 5G. This is just the impact of 5G on the world in trillions of in um, in um, billions of dollars. 127 billion in 2020, 209 billion in 2035, and we know we've already mentioned teleconferencing with Slack and Hangouts and Zoom. And um, 5G is just going to be uh, actually a smoother way to go because you can keep a 5G connection continuously. Whereas if you start your wired connection in your office and you have to leave, well, your wired connection doesn't go with you. So a 5G connection is a more healthy way to go. Virtual reality is still trying to make it. Quite why this is again going to get enhanced, who knows? I'm very skeptical about virtual reality. It's too disruptive in the way you work. Um, but uh, here is a lot of listing of um, why uh, extended reality is a good idea. Um, is well. It, it is, of course, more real, but the trouble is, it's a reality that focus forces you to focus on <coughs> on your screen or your headset, and that's not obviously the way people work today, with a variety of inputs just dashing around and hitting you. So I'm not certain it's the right model. Of course, VR can obviously do enhanced things like trying on clothes. Um, Doing virtual labs for your university homework. That's probably the one of the more interesting things. You could do a VR based physics lab. 
or engineering that. Smart cities. Well, it's um, indirectly going to benefit because it's part of the digitally connected world, which is being enhanced by uh, the events of the last few few weeks. Um, so here it says um, that here the people in China in China are using drones with thermal sensors to detect people with a temperature. If you ever go through China, China airports, you have to really show them you don't have a temperature. Um, they're very, uh, they're, they're correctly very cool. I mean, it's been proven good for them to be that cautious. Um, and then, of course, there are various apps that automate a more a, a clearer response to problems. Chatbots, obviously. Um, so anyway, this is just pointing out that the um, pervasive deployment of technology, which is internet-based and digital and distributed, is going to get enhanced due to this uh, um, virus. All right, how about right hailing? Well, there was just as I wrote this on March 30th, there was a sad story that uh, Lyft wrote to their driver saying, please go and work for Amazon um, for delivering groceries and things like that. Um, so, because Amazon is hiring and Lyft is obviously not hiring. Um, and Uber is in slightly better shape maybe, because they have Uber Eats, which up to now was losing money. But uh, obviously, I've certainly personally used Uber Eats a lot more than I ever did in the past. Um, and uh, Lyft has said that over 100,000 of its drivers have signed up for these other opportunities. Okay, here we have quantifying these issues with ride hailing in um, between Q2 2019 and 2020. Obviously, Q2 2020 is the peak of the COVID problem. We see that ride hailing went down a factor of four from 12 to three, uh, uh, probably uh, $3 billion. So that's a big effect. Whereas the eats part of Uber went up a factor too, because people like, like me were ordering dinner and lunch from time to time from local restaurants. Although they have in the eats area, they have serious competition from companies like DoorDash, which I think are actually bigger in this segment than Uber. They have a small freight component, which also went up. So that's sort of pretty interesting. Um, well, how about payments? Well, cashless payments are going to continue to go up. Um, and of course, not necessarily the ones at checkout stores, so more at uh, more the ones through through the internet. I hand my I uh, show my card to the to my to my camera and automatically get charged. Um, obviously, uh, generally retail will go down, and um, of course, when it comes up, it will inherit the ex. What the, what the customers had learned to do. And they had learned to use digital ways to pay for e-commerce. So even if they go off e-commerce, they may not go off e-payment. But of course, there's less money. And so MasterCard, Visa, PayPal will see less business. Here is... Um, Coming from the United Kingdom, that the use of money, cash is going down. That's sort of obvious. Cash is not so useful sitting at home. Because um, again, in the UK, it actually was later even than the US, but they have, they have drastic stay at home measures at the moment. Um, and it was probable that the cash will go down. Here is a current story. That in February 2019, before the virus hit, even in those days, 69% preferred cards, and only 28% cash. 1% checks. 
Well, we know the sad story of restaurants. They have to become online. So I'm now ordering a lot more food to restaurants. And um, I'm not going to them, obviously. I know to, I was talked to people in China, and their restaurants are now open, see some of them, but they're socially distanced. So you're not going to be get as many people in your restaurant as you used to. And that will probably stay for quite some time. I think socially distanced restaurants need to be thought through carefully because that means you're probably going to have half or a third the number of people, even as your maximum capacity. That's pretty serious. This this data here comes from uh, Open Table through Statista, which is this well-known source of statistics data. It likes to grab these gloomy statistics. Here is a uh, here is some data about. Um, this one is from Statistar and this one from BBC. And it's about the number of flights. And here we have uh, March and a drastic reduction in the number of flights. And here is a sad picture of lots of planes. This one is British Airways. And here is an interesting picture of some of the passengers still, still, uh, still flying. I actually haven't been to the airport for, since this thing started, and uh, I don't know whether that's whether you see this type of effect at U.S. airports. This one I took from BBC.com. So extra protection, but actually social distancing on aircraft is also a non-trivial problem because. Well, if you take these rules of several feet, that means your whole the aircraft will probably be able to hold about a third the number of people it now does. All right, here we have yet more data on the sad fate of the airline industry, which was perhaps the worst hit industry. Here you have Q2 with 88% um, to 83% declines in revenue from Delta and Southwest with America and the United, uh, very similar just between those two in size. Here you have the airline, global airline industry shooting down. Um, and <clears throat> here you have the actual impact on airports in various um, regions. I mean, it's all down around, and the new action was the worst 61% well, to 54% to 55%. Devastating. Here we have even worse, the cruise companies. Cruise companies, of course, had a bad, bad start because some of the worst early uh, COVID problems were, were on cruise ships, which uh, were uh, trapped people and COVID together. And you see here the uh, share prices and compared with the indices, here's the cruise ship shares. Down 20, down factor four, and the in this same time period, the uh, the airline industry went down a factor of two, and the general market went down a factor of 25 percent. And here you can see the actual revenue for particular companies: Carnival, Royal Caribbean, and Norwegian Cruise. Devastating. 99 percent for Norwegian Cruise, 85 percent for Carnival. Pretty shocking. Um, I think now people think that road traffic's going to um, improve because cars actually are one of the safer ways to travel because you have you don't have people you don't know uh, giving you the the virus during your travel, which is the major difficulty with all these. Well, with especially with airlines and buses and things like that. Um, and you can see here the problem with travel reflected by MasterCard travel spend. Um, for commercial, which is worse, because I mean, like for me, all my conferences are canceled. Every single one is now online or canceled totally. And um, here we have um, a big drop in the actual road traffic. Not nearly as big, of course, as for airlines, but it's still gone down. So. This is 
but not, this is a serious, non-trivial impact. All right, here we have a general comment on international, international travel as opposed to travel, where this has particularly large effect. And you can see down the, America's actually doing best with only minus 55%. Asia Pacific minus 72% and Europe minus 66%. And the overall world 65%. And the interesting thing is, of course, people expect this international travel reduction to continue after COVID, because we've learned that we don't necessarily need to do quite as much travel as we used to. And so, um, and we don't really need to go to the mall as much as we used to. Movies are a little different, it seems to me. We don't know what will happen there, although they've been devastated by COVID because uh, for obvious reasons. And um, there is even after the COVID, uh, quite, it's quite a non-trivial number. We're actually here for domestic travel, an equal number want to reduce and increase. So that's sort of flat. International travel, 37% decrease, 80% increase. So this is a non-trivial issue. Right, which is food delivery, which we've sort of already implied. Um, and there's sort of an interesting story here about um, insuring against getting the virus. Um, it's in India, so these money, this money here is not so much. And um, they say our favorite gig economy workers, who are the ones that are really taking to Airbnb and and Lyft and Uber and things, and they're the ones that are going to get the hardest hit. And so, anyway, there's a whole new industry called insuring against getting the virus. So that's the end of this particular story. And we just went through a litany of many of the things that are changed by this virus. Okay, this is backdrop, and we're in the later lessons we'll go on how to try to solve the virus. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, here is a set of slides discussing um, what can be done remotely in the COVID or post-COVID world. Here is a, a discussion um, about during COVID about um, how many people are of effective, and it's obviously very high for software and IT. 85% of individuals polled said they were effective, and that the industry, 82%. Now, retail was uh, down there at uh, 44 and 29 for the industry. Travel is surprisingly high to me, because there are people in travel who can work remotely just fine. Um, and um, Public administration maybe doesn't work because you have to talk to the public. Design, uh, maybe because these ones here, um, it's still it's reasonably high, 64. I say the industry can be done remotely, but that's nothing compared to 82 for software and IT. So these numbers are not too surprising. Here we have. Um, What's wrong when then people are just sad because they're, what is it? Collaboration and communication is uh, the highest. And loneliness, you see, this is I mean, they're sort of lonely here, sitting here, never see anybody else but my family. Um, and the fact you have to work continuously. Well, you sort of had to work continuously in the past. Uh, distractions, yeah, well, that's also true. People are always wandering into my room. Um, and so, so these are, I'm surprised actually the overall numbers are all quite low. Only 18% of people said they were lonely. I thought it might be a higher number than that. So I think the trend is clear. The overall numbers are a little surprisingly low. And here is what we're doing more of. And the one thing I notice is smart watches are small, but that's probably because smart there aren't many smart watches. It's not because fractionally they're probably getting all people with smart watches are using them more. So these numbers may be a little, little misleading. Of course, smartphones and laptops are up there near the top, especially smartphones. 
And again, desktops are presumably down there, down lower than laptops because they have more laptops than desktops. So, and most people, if they had a desktop, they had it at their business, not in their home. What they used for their general work was the laptop. All right, so here's an interesting number I, I was uh, f I found on the on the web, which here is the economic damage of COVID, 11.5 trillion dollars. Here is the cost over 10 years to prevent such pandemics. Uh, of uh, two percent of this number. Of course, it will, they won't spend this, but uh, it's interesting to know what the cost of preventing a pandemic is. Here is an interesting uh, plot of the impact on the economy, and it's dramatic. 32.9% this quarter. And it's far bigger than all previous recessions. So this is the largest sort of point recession there's ever been. I think integrated over quarters, like here you have lots of negative quarters. Even here in 2008, there were a lot of negative quarters. But this one per quarter, pain on an individual quarter, it's the worst. And um, the previous one was in 58. That's this one here, minus 10%. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, here we have some um, uh, Three different distinct analyses of the impact of the remote work. Here's what's going to happen when COVID uh, stops. Actually, most executives expect that the majority of their uh, of their um, employees will continue to work remotely, and 11% uh, of executives think just a few will. Obviously, it's going to differ from industry to industry. So, this is just reflects the distribution of industries in the survey. And over here we have what it takes to get people to go back to work. And universities have thought this through for what it takes to safety bring students back to the campus, which is obviously quite a lot. And here is an interesting comment that 44% of employee employers thinks productivity has gone up. And 31% of employers think it's gone down. So, and 25% about the same. So, you know, it's not all negative. There's, there's some effect, efficiency gains by and focus gains that you see by um, working uh, remotely. And um, here is uh, something about um, freelancer earnings which is sort of related to these issues. And you can see the US and the UK are the highest in this regard across the world. That just reflects the nature of their, of their economies and the way things like the way people want to get going. The airlines are all disastrous, but the big tech is not so bad. And in fact, Amazon's gone up 34% uh, year over year. Alphabet, Google is um, sort of a little bit up 6%. Apple is up 6%. Microsoft is up more, 14%. It doesn't have this dependence on advertising that Google has. And probably Apple is just affected by the physical nature of its products. Facebook has done better than Google because it's less sensitive to advertising. So that's the end of this set of um, slides on the impact of COVID on the world, why we have to solve it. Thank you.